pay ferries because they have uh, answers and plans. Thank you. And let's have our friends from ferries introduce themselves. John? Good evening, John Vazina, Government Relations Director for Washington State Ferries. Thanks, Senator. And Nicole. Hello, Nicole McIntosh, Chief of Staff for Washington State Ferries. All right, great. Now that we know everyone, um, I want to talk a little bit about why we're here today. Um, I think folks who are on this call probably are brought by similar reasons. Our ferry systems are facing challenges, and they have been for a long time, not just because of COVID, but certainly a spotlight has been shown on the challenges during this difficult time for all of us. And that means that our communities are facing challenges, navigating uh, commutes to work, commutes to see family, visits to the doctor, and in the San Juan Islands, kids getting home from school. We're having this town hall because your input and your experiences have been and continue to be crucial to the fight that we have to continue to invest in our system and our marine highways so that we can get where we need to go when we need to go. I'm thrilled that so many of our neighbors have sent fantastic questions and comments ahead of time and we're really excited to get into those. Um, and if you did send a question or a comment and you indicated that you'd like to ask it live, then we will, um, our staff will um, introduce you and invite you to unmute. So please listen to your name. If you sent in a question and did not want to ask it live, um, our moder staff moderators will read your question for you. You can also, folks tuning in who didn't send questions ahead of time, or if you have more, drop your questions or comments in the Q&A box on Zoom. And those of you who are watching live on Facebook right now, you can also leave questions or comments um, in the in the comments field below the video on Facebook. Staff is gonna be monitor, monitoring all the comments and sending us your questions. And we'll do our best to answer as many as we can during this time. And those we don't get to, we will um, follow up and answer after this town hall. So with that out of the way, before we get started, I'd like to turn it back over to John and Nicole for some opening remarks to kind of lay the table about the challenges that we're facing. Thanks, Senator. And, you know, I, I want to start by saying that, you know, those of you who are watching from this district are incredibly fortunate. Um, Senators Randall and Rolfus, Representative Simmons and Hansen, they are not shy about letting us know your concerns. They are in constant contact with us. They pass on the messages they get from you. And, you know, this is a difficult time for ferries, but I know it's a much more difficult time for our passengers. And so, this one to acknowledge um, how hard they and their staffs work at educating us about the challenges you're facing. Um, I just want to spend a minute um, before we start to kind of, as um, Senator Randall said, lay the table. Um, you know, as you know, coming out of COVID, we were on a reduced schedule last year that, that didn't impact your routes as much as it did others. And then this year, as we, um, as we geared up for summer, as we always do, um, three years ago, we had 24 boats. We now have 21, and we need 19 of those to run our summer schedule. 18 in the um, spring and fall when we go down to um, one boat on Port Townsend Coopville, and then the winter, 17 when the um, Sydney run to Br British Columbia is not running. So we did what we always do. We went out and started to um, recruit and hire people in the spring um, so that we could run those 19 boats. And, you know, Again, your four legislators do such a great job advocating for our service and for all of you, um, but they work with their colleagues on competing needs that, you know, people need bridges in Yakima and roads in Spokane. And so when transportation dollars are short, it's difficult to fund 19 vessels of crew all year round. So we're funded for 19 watches, um, watches for 19 vessels in the summer and then 17 in the, in the winter. You know, one wants to, you know, have a King Five expose on why aren't you, um, you know, why are you paying 19 vessels worth of people in the in the winter? So in the fall, this time of year, we lose staff, you know, the on-call staff we have um, who work really hard all summer crewing our boats, they go and get other jobs or they ask us to lay them off so they can get other jobs and come back in the spring when they get full-time work. So this spring, um, looking toward the summer, we did what we've always done. We went out and started to recruit for the busy summer. And for example, we wanted to hire 16 oilers for the engine room. We got three qualified applicants. 
And you know, we just started to immediately see that unlike last year, we were not getting the same level of interest. We were competing. There's a there's an international shortage of mariners. Um, as I said, um, we our employees are funded um, on call at the beginning. Then we got into summer and things were going okay. And then the Delta wave hit and we lost significant number of crew members um, who either were COVID positive or following CDC guidelines. If you were around someone on the boat who was positive and you weren't vaccinated, you had to quarantine. So we lost whole watches um, toward the end of the summer. And you can really see you know, early in the summer, it was like three, and then it was double digits as we moved into the fall. And then in August, when the governor announced the vaccine mandate, we began to see, um, you know, staff shortages continually based on not being able to hire as we had in the past, and also some frustration with employees about the mandate. So, you know, as all of you in Bremerton know all too well, um, just after Labor Day, looking at ridership and need, and I want to say from the outset, I know that your need is as realistic as others. I know that we have people needing, needing to work at the shipyard. We have physicians trying to get to work in Seattle. We have parents trying to be able to see their kids in the morning and the evening and not just spend their day at work or on a boat or waiting for one of our boats. But looking at the ridership numbers and what we, the vital services we send to islands, we reduced the Bremerton boat the route down to one boat the day after Labor Day because we just could not crew continually. And then in October, hearing real frustration from our passengers about how unreliable our boats were, we, we, we put in an alternative service plan that put every route on fewer boats, the Triangle Route on two, um, Seattle Bainbridge, Edmonds Kingston, Clinton Muckleteo on one. We continued one boat on the Port Townsend Coopville route. They've been on one boat for a year instead of two as they normally would have been, and then took away a boat in the San Juans. So, you know, we, we got what our aim from October 1st to 17th, we had 341 canceled sailings due to crewing. From October 18th through today, we've had about 38. So, you know, we got the reliability, but we understand that that was on the back of your ability to travel seamlessly as you had in the past. So we are focused strongly on hiring, um, restoring service where we can, um, we did lose about 140 staffers around the mandate time to retirements and separations, and that has had a real impact on our ability to crew our vessels. Um, but we are now looking at a restoration plan. And, you know, again, the four legislators here, Mayor Wheeler in Bremerton, Commissioner Garrido from, um, and Commissioners Garrido, Wolf, and Gelder, um, you have advocates who are telling us every day how difficult things are for you. But as we looked at service restoration, and again, looking at ridership and looking at, um, at need, just starting on Friday, we've, we've added the boat back on a trial basis. We have new agreements with our labor unions that allow us to move people who are on boats that are tied up due to crewing or due to um, they're having maintenance work done. In the past, that was voluntary. Now we're able to move them instead of focusing them on maintenance on the boats, we're prioritizing service. So we're back up to four boats in the San Juans. Um, then we will, um, looking at, again, ridership in need, we will restore service at Seattle Bainbridge, uh, at Clinton Muckleteo, Edmonds Kingston, the Triangle Route, and then um, Bremerton. I also wanna add that while we have this crewing challenge, as you all know, we still have vessel challenges. And again, we start, we had 24 three years ago, now we have 21. The Wenatchee is at out for several months due to a fire and the Tokate, another one of our vessels, is in for six weeks of unexpected maintenance work on an issue it had. So that puts us down to just 19 vessels. So as we look at crewing, for now, we would even be challenged with vessels to restore everything. But we're, you know, we should get the Wenatchee back in a month or so. We've got, we're working on the Tokate. Um, so, you know, we're looking at both vessel and crewing needs as we get you back to where you are. So, you know, I just say in summation, we know that this has been tough. We are not blind to it. We are not unfeeling. We, you know, we don't feel what you do, but it is frustrating for us not to be able to, to give you the service that we have provided in the past. And we are working on hiring and, you know, especially with the support of your legislators at looking at things differently than we have in the past. 
but working with Governor Inslee's office on how we can get you back to two boat service and three boats on the triangle, because we know that, you know, unlike some tourists, these are really essential transportation links for all of you. Nicole, I've sort of filibustered the last three or four minutes, but I don't know if you have anything you want to add before we turn it back over. John, that was great. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you both so much. With that, we will move into the questions that were pre-submitted by our community members. And as a reminder to those watching on the call with us in this webinar, you can drop more questions in the Q&A box at any time. And those who are watching the live stream can drop your questions in the comment field below the live video. Uh, and we will do our best to get back to you today. So we will start with a very special guest on the call, Mayor Greg Wheeler. Um, if you are still with us, you will receive an invite to unmute so that you can ask any questions or comments of our panelists. All right. Well, thank you. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. I, I, um, well, Senators, Representatives, um, Washington State Ferry Representatives, thank you for, for coming out and, um, and doing this tour. Um, difficult times. And I, I'll... I will get to the point and just a quick note, John, I appreciate you um, almost being on the clock 24 hours a day, seven days a week, because even in the one, two in the morning, if I'm getting a complaint, I'm sending it to you and I'm, I'm actually impressed that you are responding that quickly, uh, you know, and this is quite a bit so folks know. Um, I'll get to the point though, I, I was surprised and disappointed um, with the recent Washington State Ferry decision to prioritize uh, service restoration. Um, that, that right there, we've, all, we've always had issues in Bremerton and with, you know, with the priority and, and the way the service is delivered. And we've always been a partner in the effort to try to, to, try to get the service lifted so all people benefit across their entire community. But the, the prioritization, the way it came down, actually uh, picked winners and losers. And, and what that does in a pretty short, medium, and long term it has some pretty, pretty negative impacts on our citizens. We, you know, we already have a stressed, gorsed corridor right now. It's already the, uh, the infrastructure barely moves people as it is in an efficient manner where we can, where we can have freight mobility, um, military you know, folks who support our military and just folks trying to work every day, um, you know, making sure that commerce is, is efficient, you know, adding thousands of riders into that corridor every day uh, is going to have some very almost it's detrimental impacts. Now, the folks that are negotiating with their employers across the water and back and vice versa, Seattle folks coming here, they're under increased scrutiny. So we have we have people now who are trying to negotiate uh, starting and stopping times and, and, and basically some inconsistencies that, or, that put pressure on an employer, but definitely put pressure on an employee. And this, is, this has a, a huge impact on Bremerton. So I, I want everybody to know on this call that, I'm, that Bremerton myself will be a partner in the solutions. But I, I do call on all of you to be, to be bold, um, to look for other solutions, other options and to not to not create a ranking system um, because that I do believe that ranking system will not work it will fail and it will start with Bremerton but I believe it will it will hurt us tremendously but I believe it will hurt our entire community and so I will work I am here to, to work with you um, I do appreciate all of your work and um, that that concludes my comments thank you and, you know, Mayor, I thank you for what you said. And, you know, I think it's helpful for both Nicole and me as, as members of the executive team at WSF. And we, you know, we will go back and share your concern. Um, you know, we are in a difficult place. And I won't pretend for a minute it's not more difficult than your constituents who are trying to get back and forth to, from Seattle to Bremerton um, or on the um, Triangle route of we no longer have enough crew to run the vessels to, to run our full fall schedule. And so, you know, we made a commitment to the public. We came out with the alternative service plan. We said we would add a second boat when we could. 
and then we would um, we would try longer term to restore service. So that process has begun. We simply don't have the, the crewing to restore every route immediately. And honestly, with a new agreement with the labor unions, we didn't want to overcommit and start restoring lots of routes at the same time because we don't know that, that that's sustainable. And the last thing we need is for the public to trust us even less. We know that our passengers are frustrated. They, they don't trust us at the moment. And so we're trying to do things in a way that is sustainable before we add something on. We know we can do it on another route. But again, I don't want to pretend that for Bremerton being at the end of that list, um, it's, a, it's a difficult message to hear and frustrating for the vital transportation that happens on your route. Thank you so much. Unless there are any other thoughts from our panelists, I will move on to our next submitted question. We were sent a question from Judy Ray Carlson of Port Orchard, who asked, during periods of difficult to impossible service schedules, has WashDOT partnered with Kitsap Transit Fast Ferry Services? And Nicole, I'm gonna take that one. Um, in, indeed we have. Um, we have, I, I personally have a relationship with uh, John Clausen. Um, we have used their services a, a couple times on Bremerton, um, but I can tell you right now what we're starting recently. Um, Kitsap Transit has had uh, issues, frankly, with staffing as well. Um, so they're, they're in the same boat, as you will, as we are. Um, but we're going to be looking at um, entering into an agreement with Kitsap Transit so that um, more easily we have the mechanism in which to uh, add their service um, to our route when, when needed. As you know, they, they do have new vessels that um, can fit into our slips. So when we can use them, um, we, we will do that. Thank you so much. If there are no other thoughts on that, we would love to invite Deborah McDaniel of Bremerton to ask your question. Hi, can you hear me now? Hello. We can. Okay, good, thank you. So I was a ferry commuter from Bremerton to Seattle for over 20 years. I retired last year and I'm thankful that I did because I probably would have lost my job with the way the schedule is now. Um, I'm, Mr. Vizina, I'm not convinced, <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, no, I'm not sorry, I am not convinced. Um, we have had two fare increases so far this year, and service is down to less than half what it once was, including a lack of boats leaving Seattle later than 9.30 p.m. So not only do we only have one boat, but the time of service is tremendously reduced. It, it's impossible. I had a doctor's appointment at 11.45 last Friday, I'm sorry, last Monday, we drove around because there was no ferry that could get us there. And when we came back, I added to your Bainbridge traffic because there was no good option for me from to Bremerton. So Bainbridge is gonna keep picking up traffic as long as we keep constraining Bremerton. Uh, the Chimicum is frequently late. I still get the ferry alerts and I see that it's late, geez, at least every other day, sometimes every single day for at least two or three runs. Could we maybe get a faster boat like the Kaliton and put the Chimicum on another run where it doesn't have to slow down? I, I just think there's way more room for creativity and actual good service to the hardworking people in Bremerton. Thank you. Yeah, Mrs. McDaniel, you know, again, none of us feel good about the current level of service. I, I tried to be as honest and transparent as possible about why we're in this position. Um, we can certainly talk about um, internally about different boats. You know, part of the problem obviously is when you have one boat, the dwell time is longer because it's full all the time. And so the dwell time we have built in the schedule expands because loading and unloading takes longer because it's always full. And so that just cascades throughout the day. 
Um, we also have to look, you know, our union partners have been terrific in this effort and they've shown flexibility and they've had agreements with us, but we do have um, collective bargaining agreements that we have to live by. Um, boats are home ported and we do our best to, to keep people there. Um, again, we are now moving crew all over the sound to, to help with service. Um, but you know, the Chimicum is assigned to that route. It's a big boat and it does, um, it does good work, but it does struggle to keep its schedule. So you know, I'll certainly take this back. Nicole and I can talk to staff about what the options are for another boat. But again, at the moment, we don't have a lot of flexibility even with additional boats um, because of having the Wenatchee and the Tokate out. And oh, I should, I should just add one other thing because you brought this up. Um, so WSF doesn't set its fares and we know that it, it does not feel good to anyone on any route right now that, that people are paying um, full fare for drastically reduced service. Um, you know, I remember 18 months ago, Sandra Rolfus calling me um, when the summer surcharge was going on and, and talking about how tone deaf that seemed that we were gonna be raising fares right in the middle of COVID. Um, when people, when really the people traveling were doctors and nurses and essential workers. Um, you know, e the state budget, unlike a lot of transportation agencies, our pay passengers pay 75 to 80 percent of our operating costs, almost 100 percent of capital, which is, you know, it's huge. The new boats are um, close to 200 million dollars. Um, those are paid for by the state, but the vast majority of operating um, is paid for by our customers. So the legislature, the transportation committee sets um, a target of what we have to collect from fares. It's obviously challenging right now when we don't have as many people um, uh, traveling, but they did that last year at the very beginning of COVID. And they, they give that to the transportation commission. Um, sorry, they did that earlier this year. Um, they give that to the transportation commission and it says fares based on that target that they have to reach. You know, we are part of a much bigger puzzle, as I said, of, of needing transportation funds across the state. Um, but the Transportation Commission, you know, sets those rates and, and there isn't a lot of flexibility there. And I know that your legislators and others have talked about, um, you know, this, the challenge you brought up of less service and, and increased costs. And I don't know if that's something the Transportation Committee will be looking at, but um, we are competing with those other state dollars. And so, you know, those fares are not decided by us. And again, I understand it's difficult to continually pay two and a half percent more for less service. And I, I don't want to delay us too much because I know we have a lot more questions to answer, but I do want to chime in here and say that um, in the Senate and some of our colleagues in the House too, to the extent that I know, have been having conversations about how we might change some of the funding model for Washington State Ferries. Um, folks who follow the Transportation Committee know that our transportation budget is reliant pretty um, solely on gas tax in addition to some other fees. And that means that we have a challenge and a, a sh shrinking budget, shrinking budget. And we are like trying to find all the creative solutions to make sure that we don't continue to put fare increases on the backs of ferry riders who rely on our ferries, just like other drivers rely on our roads to work for them. Wonderful, thank you. Our next question is from Addison Richards of Gig Harbor. Addison, whenever you're ready, go ahead. Hey, thank you so much to all of you for your time tonight in public service. Uh, in light of that last question and the answers, you know, we talk a lot about scarcity when uh, the ferries come up, and those are for good reasons, as we just discussed. Uh, however, what's the long-term vision for the Washington State ferry system, and how does the new uh, bipartisan infrastructure package that is passed in Congress uh, help get us there? Mr. Richard, thanks for that. Um, so two things. One, you can find on our website. In 2019, we did a 2040 long range plan. Um, it listed out, you know, kind of what the next 20 years should look like. And then a few months later, we got COVID. 
Um, so we don't know exactly what our ridership is going to look like. Our planners don't know if people are going to return to commuting and what our level of service will look like. But the 2040 long range plan gives you an idea. Um, you know, I think our current level of service was decided by the legislature a while ago. And I think pre COVID and pre what we're going through now, that was seen as, um, as you know, an acceptable level of service. Um, you know, the long range plan does talk about, and I think, 10 or 15 years, maybe adding a third boat to um, Edmonds Kingston. But it's basically what do we need to do to support what we had before and do it better? Because I know that you know the routes were not perfect um, even before COVID. You know, the federal funding is interesting. A couple of things, um, and I know we have a lot of questions, so I'll try to do this quickly. Um, there is a law in Washington that all new vessels be built in Washington. Because of that, we cannot get federal tax dollars to build our new boats. So, you know, that's just the reality of the federal government is not going to give federal tax money to a state that doesn't allow competition from other states. So as we looked at the a federal transportation package, we focused on things like terminal electrification. That is something we can do. Um, and there is money and Congressman Larson was able to get money in the budget that will help us um, electrify our terminals. That takes a, a, you know, a load off the state budget that, for doing that. I will say, um, and I'm, I'm a, a native Alaskan, Senator Murkowski from Alaska did a very good job to get her vote on that bipartisan infrastructure package. Um, there is an incredible amount of money going for ferries, but in that language, they have to be routes of 50 miles or more which we don't have in Washington state. And actually shockingly, the only state that does have them is Alaska. So there will be quite a bit of money going to support the Alaska Marine Highway system. But for um, Washington state ferries, you know, we work on federal grants, we look at federal money all the time. Um, but the, from this just passed infrastructure package, most of the help we'll get will be from electrifying terminals. But I wanna jump in here if I can, Emily, Senator Randall. Um, the, the federal infrastructure package has significant resources for other parts of the state's transportation budget. So whether that's funding for culvert replacement or bridge replacement or new highway construction, every we have a long range transportation plan in this state and every dollar that we can trade out, a state dollar with the new federal money is more money available for the ferry legislators to fight for funding for the ferry system. And because the legislature as um, a larger group agreed that the boat should be made in Washington to support our maritime industry, they have the rest of the legislators have a kind of a moral obligation to help us um, if we can't get federal funds to help us with the state funds. So we'll be using that as we're working with our colleagues when we get back in January and really pushing um, to make sure ferries are part of whatever infrastructure package that we put out. Thank you all. Our next question is not only from Amber Casey of Bremerton, but also was just dropped in the chat um, by Eric Morley, who asked, what is the timeline for bringing a second boat back to the Bremerton run? So as I talked about a little while ago, there is not um, you know, we have released the, the service restoration plan. And as I said, um, we started a trial in the San Juans last Friday. So, um, you know, not even a week ago. It's going well so far. Um, if we can staff that um, reliably, then we will go to um, Seattle Bainbridge, Clint Muckleteo, Edmonds Kingston, the Triangle Route, and then Seattle Bremerton. I, you know, it gives me no pleasure to say that in a group of people who are from Southworth and Bremerton, um, but we are looking at the resources we have and at ridership and need. We, you know, we, we've got to get it back to island communities, obviously. Um, so, um, and then when we get the crewing and, you know, as Nicole said earlier, we've hired, um, you know, we have oilers that we're training and hiring constantly. Um, we just had four new people join. They went, they finished their training on Saturday a week ago and they went to work in familiarization on the vessels on Sunday. Um, so I can't give you a precise date. I can just tell you that, you know, we're looking at both getting boats back in service so that we have enough boats to, to um, 
to operate every route and also hiring so that we can um, get your route restored to two boats as quickly as we can. But you know, it, it's not going to be a matter of the next few weeks. It's probably more like the next couple of months. Perfect. Thank you. Next up, we have a question from Alina of Kingston, who said, is there any way to make the first couple of years for new ferry employees more stable regarding which runs they are assigned to? So I'll, I'll take that, um, Anna. Uh, Nicole McIntosh, Chief of Staff. Um, again, uh, as, as John mentioned, um, well, what I can say is what we've heard in terms of stability for our new employees is really the fact that over the summertime, John mentioned we have 19 vessels to crew. In the winter, we have 17. That's quite a few, few member, uh, uh, crew members that um, are no longer needed to actually run our, our service. So what's happened in the past is either they stay on and get very little work as on-call employees, or we lay them off. Um, in the springtime, then, when our service increases again, we need those employees back. Um, very few actually return uh, to, to service for us. So we're training new employees um, all over again. So what, what we're looking at doing in the governor's office is really pushing on this too, is making sure that we can find work for our on-call employees so, so we have stable work all year round. So some options are adding crew members to, to vessels. Um, that can also help if a, if a crew member has a flat tire on the way to work, we have an extra crew member, we can sail, sail that vessel. Looking at um, relieving employees so that they can take both mandatory training and Coast Guard training um, and still operate our vessels. Um, we're looking at doing additional maintenance on you know, painting our vessels. So we are looking at several different options so that we can keep those, those employees that we desperately need in the summertime for our 19 vessel service year round um, while contributing. So I hope that answers your question. Beautiful, thank you. Um, one of our viewers on Facebook, Krishane Jones asked, how is ferry route ridership information typically collected and analyzed? Since Bremerton ferry riders often take other routes when necessary during service cuts, such as South Worth, Bainbridge and Kingston, or drive around instead, this would seem to skew ridership info in favor of non-Bremerton routes. How is that accounted for? Yeah, that's a great question. And one of the things that our planners talk about all the time is, um, you know, because we get fair criticism, right? You don't count the people who, who you've sent away and that's on every route. You know, we know on, you know, with the island, people can drive around the North End. So the planners um, work with statistics. They work with information provided by the counties on population and then looking at ridership on, um, from past years to come up with, you know, where the, where the constraints are and where the ridership is. You know, we know that, that, Bremerton, for example, was on two boats for most of the summer, and the ridership, even when you know we were doing boats on multiple two boats on multiple rides, routes, was still less than on the other routes. And you know, unfortunately, with options of driving around, and you know, as you know, painful as it is, and Miss McDaniel um, described that well of having to drive around to go to a doctor's appointment. Um, people on islands don't, you know, some of the islands on Vashon and in the San Juans don't even have that option. So the planners who are way smarter than me, um, they have metrics for uh, measuring it. And, you know, and, and they met with operations and with customer service and with vessels and looked at all those metrics and came up with the service restoration plan. Uh, if I can add, John, um, we also, uh, we haven't done one since you've been here. so. It's not on the top of your mind, but we do perform origin destination surveys. I think the last one was done in, in 2014 or so, 13. where we actually go out on vessels and interview those that are riding. Where do you, how often do you typically take the run? Where do you start? Where do you end? Are, are you working? Are you tourist? And that, that helps with, the, as John was mentioning, the, the planners determine um, who's taking the vessels and when. So we were due to do another origin destination survey when COVID hit. So we didn't want to uh, take the effort when we didn't have as many riders. Um, it wouldn't be very accurate. So that's, that's been pushed off until we get back up to normal. 
And thanks, Nicole. And that is on our website. It was 2013. And you can see that on our website. But as Nicole said, we were very well aware it needed to be updated. We were just about to do it because travel patterns, especially in Kitsap County, have clearly changed in the last seven years. And then COVID hit. And it's not worth doing the effort and spending the money until people can return to more normal travel. Ridership information on the website right now? Yes. Um, we have it's on the website, and um, we actually have a, a new tool that we're just testing out that is updated quarterly that shows ridership on every route um, that we can certainly share as well. Wonderful. Next, I'd love to invite Eric Morley of Bremerton to go ahead and unmute and ask your question. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Um, so uh, I, I appreciate the, the islands needing critical service, and that is something that they should have. It should be noted, though, that Bainbridge Island technically may not fit into the Vashon and San Juan Islands Island categories, as they do have a bridge where they can access it and drive around. It's a lengthy commute. And they're going to encounter the same problems as Gorst, with Gorst as we do here in Bremerton. I, I believe, you know, riding the ferries for, for a number of years now, there's always been a disparity of treatment. Anybody from Bremerton who has ridden the ferries recognizes that there is a difference between Bainbridge Island and Bremerton. Everything from the construction of, of Coleman Dock in crisscrossing the boats so that Bainbridge could get access to the brand new loading docks, um, to the types of boats that they run and Bremerton being first dropped from the, scare, the, the schedule. And Mr. Vizina, you also mentioned that, you know, that, that Bainbridge was dropped and has had, has had service disruptions. They were dropped for an, a couple of hours before their service was restored. What I am interested in hearing is it feels like there's a lot of finger pointing toward Washington State Ferries. And I also want to hear from our senators and representatives, because Mr. Vizina cited a number of local um, legislative and legal issues and challenges that they're, that they're facing. Um, and I want to understand how this is as much a legislative issue as it is a Washington State Ferry issue. And I wanna hear from our representatives and our senators on what their plans are also to address this and to make Mr. Vizina's job and, uh, easier and, and Ms. Mac Mac McIntosh's jobs easier to get done and restore that service, not in months, but in weeks and also making sure that this doesn't happen again in the future. Well, I'll start by invite my colleagues certainly to jump in as well. Um, I mean, to your desire, which I think we all share to have service restoration in weeks, Washington is a part-time legislature and we have limited authority outside of legislative session, which begins the second Monday in January and which we've um, I think all been working on our plans to put into place as soon as, as we possibly can. Um, on the Transportation Committee in the Senate, and I know my colleagues in the House as well, have been really digging in and trying to negotiate a transformative transfer transportation package, one that will invest not only in roads and bridges and maintenance and operation, but also in ferries. Apart and in addition to that, we have been having conversations, as I mentioned earlier, around creative operating budget solutions, whether that's using some of the federal money, as Senator Rolf has mentioned, um, to plug different holes so that we can use state money for some ferry needs, but or you know other different um, different funding possibilities. Those conversations are happening every week um, regularly between a lot of different legislators. We've also previously funded a staffing study that has had preliminary results shared so far and explores new ideas to how we can help support the staffing model. We're <clears throat> here tonight to hear from you all about your 
concerns, but I appreciate your point, Eric, that you know it's going to take all of us working together to solve these problems. And we don't expect fairies to solve them on their own. We are here to be part of the team and supporting those efforts. Yeah, thank you, Senator Randall. I'll just say, Eric, you know, it was when I first joined the legislature this year, um, I definitely came from, you know, a person that lives in Bremerton who um, relied on the Bremerton run to go to Seattle to work um, and, you know, have commuted on that boat for many years and also had the same questions. I, you know, at first I um, probably said it too often to John, um, you know, that I, I felt like Bremerton um, was not being considered maybe because of the class difference um, and the wealth disparities between Bainbridge and Bremerton. And what I learned quickly though, is that I'm gonna be more effective if I'm not splitting us against each other and that I'm looking for a solution that lifts all boats, um, including you know, Bainbridge and Kingston and not um, you know, uh, kind of doing the um, oppression Olympics. Um, and so now I am very grateful that I'm part of the Fairy Caucus and we are meeting every other week, all of the legislators that um, care about fairies and have legitimate concerns, no matter where you live in the 23rd district. We, we actually have three ferry routes. We have the Kingston, Bainbridge and Bremerton and all of my constituents um, matter to me and their needs matter. And so what I have found is that when I'm organizing with other legislators who care about the fairies, that we can draw upon our collective power to get the solutions that we really need um, which is a significant investment in new ferries, um, electrification of the ferries, and the workforce, and also bringing up new ideas about our workforce and how we can have less barriers to get into the workforce. Um, really looking at it um, through an equity lens and how we can remove some of the barriers. Um, criminal history um, tends to be one of those barriers where you know one in three people in our country has a criminal record of some kind but can't join the workforce because they're restricted through federal um, regulations around getting a TWIC card. And so how can we um, advocate with our congressional delegation to change that at the federal level? That's something you know, Senator Randall and I have been really uh, talking about and, um, and, and uh, vocalizing to our congressional delegation. So it's a, it's a huge problem, but I think um, when I made the mistakes of really, um, getting upset about Bremerton versus Bainbridge, that wasn't really effective. So I, I'm learning how to be more effective by working together with all of the ferry delegation. And I, I don't wanna go ahead, Senator Wolfus or Representative Hansen, but Mr. Morley, you know, just to thank you for what you said, um, as Representative Simmons was saying, there are 11 legislative districts that touch ferry routes. So there are 33 ferry legislators. Um, your four have consistently been four of the most active, the ones who are here tonight, um, in advocating for exactly what you said. You know, this is part of the state highway system. Um, it's challenging, but if there was a hole in the middle of I-5, the whole world would be rushing to patch it. I will say, I feel like now, the whole world is rushing to patch it. Um, Governor Inslee's office has met with your legislators. They have certainly met with us. Um, you know, I have heard from legislators in the last few months that ferry legislators who I haven't heard from before. So I think they will join your four in, um, in you know, in really advocating during the legislative session for um, for better service. And I and I, I deeply understand, and I can't the same way you do. It is frustrating to be in Bremerton and to see, you know, to feel that Bainbridge is always getting better service. You know, if if we have to do something like giving Bainbridge the better, um, the newer um, causeway um, transfer span, it's because the overhead loading, we need more people going to, Bremer, to Bainbridge. They have more population, their boats are busier. So it's not based on anything other than data, but I understand that it doesn't feel that way. Thank you so much. We have a question sent in by Kathy from Port Orchard who said, can Kitsap Transit put a dock at South Worth? So that's a great question. Uh, we talked earlier about uh, Washington State very long range plan. Um, and actually, as part of our long range plan, it shows that we have a need um, for two slips at Southworth. And we have been coordinating with Kitsap Transit 
um, for that second slip to be a joint slip between Kitsap Transit and Washington State Ferries. Um, we can uh, partner to, to go for federal funds um, and be a lot more successful in that way. So um, it's definitely something both agencies are interested in. Um, and now we just need to, to get the funding to, to make it happen. Um, there are some, I do want to mention, it's not going to be easy. Um, there are um, very pristine eelgrass beds in the area that we're going to have to um, permit the use of another dock there, as well as tribes that we have to coordinate with on the use of um, overwater cover. So. Thank you. Also about South Worth, of which we had a few questions. Um, we have Joy Lee. Uh, if you are with us, if you could unmute and ask your question, that'd be great. Hi, yes, thank you um, for giving me a chance to ask a question. So regarding um, Kids Up Transit, um, not only are they, I think they're looking for moorage space, not just docking space. And with the Triangle District um, or runs trying to um, meet the many challenges that Fauntleroy has, um, it seems like we hear that Fauntleroy has priority over the Southworth dock being reconfigured. Um, it seems as though if we can, I'm, I'm wondering how closely is Kitsap Transit able to be a full partner with Washington State Ferries so that both transit agencies can meet their needs. Because it seems like if we get POF ferries going, we can eliminate, possibly eliminate some of that Fauntleroy pressure. Um, but they need not just docking space, but also moorage space. And I'm wondering how closely uh, Kitsap Transit is in that planning process and not just waiting for Washington State Ferries to say, well, do something, but having their needs considered and the priorities of things. Thank you. Um, Kitsap Transit is very much um, an active partner in um, applying for funds for a second slip for Southworth. But you mentioned in terms of just tying a vessel up overnight, um, they have approached Washington State Ferries regarding using our Southworth dock um, to tie up a vessel. I'll just tell you, there's while we, we'd love to partner with them, there are some constraints that do have to um, be worked around, one of which is the existing dock itself um, could not really withstand a, a float being tied up next to it. It's a timber dock, hasn't been designed for that sort of use. Um, so there would need to be additional structure added to that dock that we eventually want to replace. So it would need to be a temporary situation. Um, and then of course, as I mentioned earlier, the permits that are will be required to add such a, a float um, for their vessel would need to be um, permitted and as well as getting gotten permission um, from the tribes in the area. So very much um, we're, John Clausen, especially, um, he is, uh, we're, we, we talk frequently um, and he's prioritizing passenger only for kid, kids up county. Anna, I want to jump in for a second. Um, John Clausen, who Nicole has mentioned on John Clausen a few times, he's the director of Kitsap Transit for folks who aren't, aren't following Kitsap Transit that closely. Um, I have heard, just based on the question conversation, I do hear um, in my mind uh, for a conversation that I don't know if it's happening behind the scenes or whether legislators can be helpful in working with Kitsap Transit to see if there's a way to supplement service until the two boats come back. And so um, it's not probably not fair to have that conversation without John Clausen here, but Greg Wheeler I know is Mayor Wheeler is on the board and that may be a conversation we can have offline. Um, the, I also wanted to say, um, I saw Mark Biggs's comment in the chat and his story about his son's five hour commute is not um, extraordinary, sadly. We hear that we've heard that story from dozens of people. And I know that Nicole and John are aware of those stories. And so it seems like the best way to, we, to handle that is to get two boats back um, as quickly as possible. And if, if, 
if we have an est if we can get an estimate a realistic estimate from fairies about whether that's three weeks or three months that gives us all over here better opportunity to plan so we'll try to get some more specific information it, it's the answer is not if the answer isn't next week none of us are going to be happy but we need to be able to know what the answer is and then thirdly deborah um, a couple of times talked about we're paying more for less and that is a um, sentiment that we hear whether it's kingston or bainbridge or bremerton or southworth I, I don't know if it's the other areas are talking about it too but i think that's something that legislators on this call can take a look at we have there is um fair tech part of our fares are paying for a capital construction for new ferries and if there's a way to ship some of that money around like we talked about earlier we may be able to take a stab at that and see if we can get at least a reprieve from that. But I didn't want Deborah's comment about value to go unaddressed because it's held by a lot of people. And I'm hoping Nicole and John, you've heard that on your other town halls, but it's certainly something we can take away from this too. Thanks, Senator. And Hannah, if I could just jump in quickly with something. Uh, Ms. Lee brought up something really important that I'm, I'm glad she did. For anyone who's in the Southworth area, um, two things. One, we not only coordinate with Kitsap Transit on um, the fast ferry, we also do with buses. So like when we wrote the, um, rewrote the triangle schedule, we worked closely with them on, you know, making sure that we did things so that we didn't impact their bus schedule and they could still meet our boats because no one wants to, you know, be on a boat that's on time and then stand outside for 45 minutes in the rain. So we do good coordination with them on that. The other thing Ms. Lee brought up, and if you're in Southworth, I hope you'll take this seriously. We are in the beginning process of um, updating our dock in Fauntleroy. And unlike, I think, any of our routes, this has three government jurisdictions. So Southworth is Kitsap County, Vashon is King County, and Fauntleroy is City of Seattle. And the, the folks in Fauntleroy are incredibly active. Um, they have resources, they have attorneys, um, they do not want that dock changed at all. They agree with us that because of um, sea level rise due to climate change, it has to be raised. It's not seism it's seismically vulnerable. Um, but we need a robust public process with people from Kitsap County, from the Southworth area, those riders, and also Vashon participating. So we get input from all three areas. Um, you can go on our website and look about, about how to get involved. If you don't want to go to the, the meetings that happen quarterly, you can submit comments, but it will really be a problem if Southworth is not represented in the conversations about how we update that doc. Thanks, Hannah. Thank you all so much. Um, to be mindful of everyone's time and because we only have a few minutes left, um, if we could please move into closing remarks, that would be wonderful. And as a reminder to folks who sent in questions, thank you again for doing that. We will do our very best to follow up with you. Um, and now we'll move into closing remarks. And I will actually ask, uh, I will ask John, if you could please start off with those, I will call on folks to, to conclude. Thanks, Hannah. Uh, thanks all of you who have attended again. You know, I, while we're empathetic, we know we're not feeling this pain in the same way you are. Um, as I've said repeatedly, your elected officials are taking a lead with ferry legislators and the governor's office, and certainly with WSF and expressing um, what you're all going through and those good anecdotal stories that while painful to read or hear um, are helpful as we make service decisions. So, you know, we appreciate the patience you've been able to show. We are not um, ignorant. We don't sit in Seattle. Um, ignorant of the impacts of our service, and we are doing our best to hire more people, get boats repaired, get boats built, so we can, you know, not only restore, but improve the service we've had in the past, and just really appreciate the, the time you took tonight to listen. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. How about you next, Nicole? Just real briefly, thank you for your questions, and I know there's a, a, a bunch of questions that we didn't have time to answer, but I know, um, John will follow up with uh, staff here to make sure that we get you the best answers um, that we have. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Representative Hansen. 
Hey, uh, I didn't jump in on the Q&A mostly because I wanted to get through as many questions as we could, but just, you know, thank you to State Fairage for doing this and for everyone for coming. I will say on that long range kind of question and like, what's the deal with you legislators? What are you doing? Uh, which is a reasonable question. Uh, most of our value add is going to be organizing internally in the legislature in, you know, just short of 60 days to make sure transportation budgets treat highways, as, treat ferries as the marine highways they are, right? And that's what we always try to do. We're not always successful. I voted against the last gas tax increase because it didn't put enough money into ferries. So like, we're prepared to do that again. So just, you know, we're, we're that's that's what our job Job mostly is to try to fight for more money for ferries like marine highways. So <laughs> believe you me, we, we shall be doing this, but thanks all. Thanks, Representative. Representative Simmons. Yeah, thank you so much to everybody who joined today and especially our partners at the Washington State Ferries for being in the hot seat. It is difficult right now with session not being in um, and our hands are pretty tied right now on what we can actually do. But I, I do promise you that I am um, organizing with other colleagues, um, making phone calls to our transportation uh, negotiators in the House, and also um, willing to stand with Representative Hansen and others um, to not vote for any uh, budget that would not prioritize uh, uh, our ferries. I also am from Burberton and really understand the challenges of the working class folks who live here and the intersectional issues around family time and mental health and all kinds of things that are tied to this problem. So it is a top priority for me in the coming session. Thank you, Representative. Senator Rolfus. Thanks, Anna. Um, and thanks again to Nicole and John. And it's their job to be in the hot seat and it's their job to solve these problems. And I'm glad, thank you for um, working with us to have this town hall today. Um, I want folks to know that when the Ferry Caucus, which is what the legislators, we legislators refer to ourselves as, um, the Ferry Caucus is feared by legislators, other legislators, and when we organize, there are more of us than there are like the 405 legislators or the Seattle legislators. And so um, I'm pretty confident that when we get back in January, we'll be solving, we'll be working together to solve some of these problems and I want it, I want it to not go without seeing that when Bremerton loses a boat, the gaps in service are so much more than when Clinton, Muckle, Teo, Kingston and Bainbridge lose a boat. And that the concern the concerns are valid. The lack of service at night is horrible. And um, I'm committed to working with ferries and my colleagues to get this boat back and with the service that we had in 2019. So confident we can do it. Um, and I want folks to know that that is a goal. Thanks, Senator. And last but not least, Senator Randall. Thank you all so much for joining us tonight. And I also wanna thank our colleagues from Washington State Ferries, John and Nicole for answering tough questions and fielding the feedback that our community members that all of you have shared. I also wanna thank you for stepping up and using your voices and and asking tough questions and giving your really candid feedback. It is so helpful to us to have your voices and your concerns, your questions behind us when we go to do the tough work in Olympia to make sure that we're prioritizing um, restoring service to Bur the Bremerton route and funding our ferries so that we can be more successful in the future and have a greater continuity of service. It's, um, I, re I really hear Rep Simmons point earlier about um, some communities speaking more loudly and um, using their voices to organize like similar um, to what's happening in Fauntleroy. Those folks are really organizing, organized. They know who to contact. And so it's helpful for us to have the voices of our community in Bremerton and Southworth behind us as we go to do this work. So thank you for being here tonight. And I hope you won't stop sharing your feedback with us so that we can work to build a more effective system together. And I, I just want to just very quickly, I know that next week um, there's a meeting for Bainbridge and Kingston that I want to make sure people are aware of. And also look in early January, ferries will be doing a system wide um, public webinars to talk about the governor's budget request so we can explain that and answer any questions then. So that will be you know probably just before the legislative session starts in early January. 
Awesome. Thank you. And before we sign off, I want to um, give a special shout out and thank you to Mayor Wheeler from Bremerton, who joined us today and has been such a strong advocate, as well as Captain Tim Saffel, who we didn't hear from, but is a resident of Kitsap County and also the vice president of Masters, Mates, and Pilots Union that represents the licensed deck officers on board Washington State Ferries. We're really grateful for your partnership and your advocacy. Have a good night, everyone.